Reconstructions of real life rescues now on BBC One in 999. All of tonight's rescues are true stories. We've sometimes used actors and stuntmen, but everything you see is based on the accounts of the people involved. They've helped us to reconstruct events as they happen. Tonight on 999, a late night jaunt on Brighton Beach goes disastrously wrong. The ultimate test of the skills of the lifeboat crew. The car crash no one sees. He's got a stake through his chest and very little time to find help. And a real life nightmare. A woman's trapped in her bedroom after a last cigarette that threatens to stub out her life. It's a daily ritual here in Brighton. The members of the town swimming club aim to take the plunge every single morning of the year. But there are days when the weather makes it simply too dangerous. If the weather turns, this beach can look a very different place. When it's rough, the waves can be 40 feet high, and at the point where they break, the beach can be very unstable. In just a matter of seconds, you can be swept out into the water. And even though you're only yards from safety, rescue from the beach is almost impossible. It's very dangerous, particularly if you're new to the area, as four students found out to their cost. They'd only just met and had spent an evening getting to know each other. Anybody fancy a chip? No, thanks. I'm a chip. Diet. In our reconstruction, actors well, play so. the parts of Ben very Stone, exciting. Vicky Knight yeah. and Lisa Vitra. Oh, I was going to start a degree course at the university in photography. When the accident happened, I'd been down for about a week. I met Lisa Leeds the week before, and I said, right, well, I'm moving too. We'll meet up. Oh, could you hold that for me, please? I didn't know each other very well, but instead of, like, being awkward with each other, I think everybody sort of went totally the opposite way and just got really, really friendly. Come on, hurry up, Ben. We want to go for walk by the sea. Let's do it. Oh, come, come on! on. Come on. <laughs> Won't oh, for me! Come on, you never think of anything but your stomach. I was really looking forward to living in Brighton, experiencing new things and meeting new people, and I'm sure that Vicky felt very much the same way, so it was like a really powerful sort of enthusiasm. We were just messing about, like children, and having fun. I remember the waves being really unpredictable. <laughs> like, one wave would come up a lot further than the next one, and then the next one again would be a lot different. The sea was rough that night. The Coast Guard had been called out to investigate a report of a missing fisherman. Somebody had come off the beach at Brighton saying that he was fishing with somebody near the Peter Pan playground. He couldn't find his friend when he'd gone back and was concerned for his safety. Um, we were told to meet this gentleman by a phone box on, uh, on Marine Parade. This is Shore Mobile. We've checked the phone boxes in Marine Parade and there doesn't seem to be any sign of anyone here. Over. Roger, Shore Mobile. Have you checked the beach? Meanwhile, the crew of the Brighton lifeboat was monitoring the Coast Guard operation. Oh, I've got there, Richard. Oh, it's a standby only from the Coast Guard. Out they asked us to stand by because they thought it was possibly what they call a false alarm with good intent. And really and truly, it's stupid to risk lives of lifeboat crewmen when there is that amount of uh, doubt. Oh, you nutters, you still got your shoes on. Oh, it's in there. Come in. Come no, it's down. freezing. It's not. Oh, come on. I'm not going to go in, are you? No, <laughs> We were laughing, saying, not me. <laughs> I wouldn't do that, because it's cold. Anyway, um, and then this... One wave knocked them both over. I was kind of scared, but also not proper scared. They just got themselves up and another one hit them. It was the difference between a pebble beach and a sandy beach. You stand on the pebbles and it feels like it's an earthquake or a rug being pulled out under your feet, basically. There's no way you can, you can stand up because every single pebble is just rolling. Are they all right? 
just as they were getting up from the, the second wave, a huge wave went right over them. <laughs> when it went back, they they sort of gone. In a matter of seconds, the girls had been swept 60 feet from the shore. You think there's some way you can get back. You don't really believe it's happening. And then when I was dragged quite far out, I looked back at the beach and I knew there's no way I could swim back there. That's when it was just terrifying. I think it's serious. Stay here, I'm going for some help. I turned around and ran back up to the street because I, I know there's a phone box by the entrance to the pier. Luckily, there was, like, two guys in luminous jackets. I mean, they could have been anybody. But I just, like, assumed they were Coast Guards, and they were. There's some girls being swept into the sea. There's two girls in the sea down by the pier. If he'd arrived 30 seconds later, we would have been gone. Southern Coast Guard, this is sure and mobile, immediate. One minute they were visible, the next minute waves just went over the top of them, and in between you could hear them scream. They were almost within striking distance of the shore, as it were, only 20 or 30 yards out, but the, the way the sea was, there was no way we could go and rescue them without effectively committing suicide. Two girls washed into the sea under the Palace Pier, bright and twist immediately. We knew there was imminent life in danger. There was somebody who'd been seen actually go in the water. So that's unusual. Usually you, you arrive there a few minutes after it's all happened, but this was happening now. This is Brighton Lifeboat to Brighton Lifeboat. We're leaving Marina from Paddis Pier. There's always a moment of anticipation as the boat leaves the calmness of the inner harbour when you see the actual sea um, at the entrance of the marina. You never know, especially in the dark, quite what to expect. Martin, give me the spotlight, give me the spotlight. I need it on that entrance. We shined it at the entrance and it was just like a huge washing machine on full bore. We've had so many incidents, you know, the people are hanging onto the pier and then they're gone. And it's impossible to search for them in the darkness. You can be on one side of the wave and they could be on the other side and you wouldn't see them at all. So I think we we're all very determined that we were, you know, we were going to get there. Suddenly, the pier was there in front of us. And just before that, it was so far away, it seemed an impossibility to get anywhere near it. Your brain works so fast and you react so quickly. It felt like there was no space for fear. Every time the wave came, they were so powerful, they would knock you against the bar, and it was really like getting hit by a a van or something, you know. I climbed up onto the strut, so I managed to, like, get up and and get, like, a leg over it, and I was holding onto it. And then I reached down to get Lisa. Please give me your hand. And a wave just blew me off. The waves were uh, probably beyond the capabilities of our boat. But then Atlantic 21, it's like driving a wild motorised surfboard. You've got to be in exactly the right position in the waves at all times. If you're not, you've had it. Somehow, this wave more or less pushed me back up on the bar because all of a sudden I found myself sitting um, comfortably on the crossbar. You know? Pretty lucky position. It was taking a lot of my energy holding onto her. It did occur to me that for me to survive, I might have to let go of her in order for me to keep all my strength to hold on. And it was just a split second. And then the next split second, I realised thinking, there's no way I could ever do that. Yeah, right, lifeboat, if you can give me an ETA again, please, over. Sure, lifeboat, ETA, two minutes. They're clinging onto the underside of the pier. They're about 20, 30 yards. People started to appear. There are a lot of pubs and clubs in that area. They, like us, could see that the girls were relatively close to the shore, but they weren't necessarily in a, a, a state of mind that allowed them to make a, a coherent decision. What are you? There's two girls in there. It's OK, there's a lifeboat on the way. Yeah, so what? It's in hand. Right? Yeah, well, why don't you go and do your job, Mr Coast Guard? Go in there and save them. Look, if I don't stay up here, there'll be no one to tell the lifeboat where to go, right? We were the guys in the yellow jackets. We were the ones that were supposed to jump in and pull them out. 
like Baywatch or something. Hey, Look, get in there and though? save him or I'll have you. Leave it, will you? Well, one guy decided he was going to try um, and be a hero. He ran down, took a headlong dive into the sea and about three, four seconds later was a mass of arms and legs just washed up with the next wave. He just sort of chewed him up and spat him out. As the lifeboat headed for the pier, Vicky and Lisa fought to survive in the stormy seas. I knew it was a question of time. I knew it was about holding out as long as we could till help came. Once the lifeboat got to the pier, it would have to manoeuvre through the metal structure to try to rescue Lisa and Vicky. I just felt like I was breathing water. I was getting really cold. I can just remember thinking that I'd go to sleep and then something would happen and it would all be all right. It was just like a real overwhelming urge to go to sleep. We passed under the pier on the back of a wave and as the wave hit the beach, it actually uncovered the girls and they were actually in the next set of girders closer to the beach, uh, far closer really than what I wanted to be. It was only when we actually saw them on the pier that I thought, how the hell are we going to get these people off there? Because I had absolutely no idea. My plan was to lay the lifeboat alongside them, grab them over the side of the lifeboat, and then continue on quickly under the pier. I seem to recall him shouting, hold on, we're going in, or words to that effect. And I thought, oh, God. And just before we enter, I see this piece of metal sticking out of the pier, and I just knew that was going to damage the boat. Flash straight across my mind, we're going to get hurt here. It completely ripped open the forward sponson, which is the inflatable tube that surrounds the boat. It pulled off the lifelines and completely made the boat unseaworthy. I was pushing hard on the throttles in order to almost wedge the lifeboat into the girder work in order to hold it in position. I didn't really spot them till they were really, really close. It seemed like all of a sudden they were just there. I remember them reaching out, shouting at me to jump. I remember thinking that they'd seen me, but they hadn't seen Vicky. And I didn't want to let go of Vicky if they hadn't seen her. We knew it would be very difficult to hold the boat in a position for any length of time. There was no gentleness about it. We knew we had to just grab all of them and haul them in as quick as we could. They were trying to pull me into the boat. I was actually forced to let go of her hand. They actually managed to get one girl off fairly quickly. They dragged her across the bar and they started to scream at the other girl to come forward. But uh, I think it was a long way to go. It was asking a lot for her to do. I think I was losing it quite badly by that point. Lisa being pulled in and, being, and letting go of me and just like trying to scramble to hold on to something because she was like my only means of support then. In one deep trough, we actually dropped quite a long way down below this bar, so much so that I was able to scream to Joe and Martin, I'm going in. And I actually pushed the throttles forward and pushed the whole front end of the lifeboat into the girder works. They were screaming to the girl, come on, you must come, you must come now. So by now I've got uh, two crewmen and the girl there and I can see a, another big roller coming down the pier and the crossbar is actually somewhere above my head. So all I could do was just sort of ease it back slightly so that as the wave hit us, this crossbar actually fell just in front of what we call the centre console. I couldn't get away quick enough as the next wave came through and pushed the deck of the boat up against the steelwork. I had both legs caught between the deck and the steelwork itself. It didn't seem to stop rising up and crushing. And I did wonder whether I was going to uh, get out of there. Um, 
with some legs. As the wave passed, Martin's legs were freed. Although he was in great pain, he kept trying to reach Vicky. Another wave came along, which was even higher than the rest. And this had the effect of actually dumping tons of water down onto the unsupported deck. Push the back end of the boat up into the air, right up so much so that in fact I believe the propellers were actually just under the decking of the pier. And I found myself really desperately now trying to hang on. I can remember holding onto her wrist and the next wave coming through and completely submerging her. I can remember hanging over the edge of the, the boat. I'm holding onto her wrist thinking that I was actually going to pull her arm off. I was holding on so tightly. As I was like, kind of like going down, it felt like somebody else was catching me. And the lifeguard just like grabbed me and was just like pulling me up by, by my other hand. She was half on, half off, and that's where a second wave came. I just remember the bar coming down directly for this girl's head. But I still held on and I just thought, that's it, she's dead. And it was just amazing how, as the wave passed through, we dropped back down. The front of the boat came up and it acted almost like a, a shovel. And it managed, I presume, to scoop the girl up. And all three of them were still on the deck. I can't believe that all three of them were still there. In hindsight, I think that if the sponson hadn't have burst, she could have been dead. Because uh, with the sponson gone, it gave her that magic foot that gave her the space that she needed to survive the impact of the bar. Vicky and Lisa were both safely aboard, but their rescue wasn't over yet. Richard still had to manoeuvre the damaged boat into open water. We were in quite a bit of danger here because we had a very unstable boat. My priority here was to try and find any sort of calm area of water. It was now too risky to attempt to return to base. They had no option but to wait out at sea for another boat to take them ashore. I just realised more than straight away that we were still in danger on the boat. It wasn't like, oh no, this is, this is really frightening, I'm still in danger. It was just like, oh, please. Don't let it carry on anymore. So on Coast Guard, this is Brighton lifeboat. We have serious bail damage, serious bail damage. We have picked up the two girls. So are they all right or what? Yeah, they're OK. They're in the boat, but we don't know what the state of them is, and we're going to have to get another lifeboat to them when the boat's damaged. Yeah, mate. Are they all right? Yeah, they're OK. They're in the lifeboat. Yeah, I'm really sorry for me go early. It's OK. It's okay. Yeah, Brighton lifeboat, uh, we're going to task New Haven lifeboat to come out and assist you. Over. Can you say something to me? Are you OK? Just thinking, I, I can't really say anything, and um, but I've got to let them know I was all right, and I was holding one of their hands, and so I just kind of squeezed it. And I think he realised that I was all right, but I didn't have any energy to talk. Although Lisa and Vicky had been severely buffeted by the waves, they escaped with serious bruising. After a hospital checkup, they were able to go home. Martin Ebdel wasn't seriously injured either. In May 1996, Martin and his two colleagues were each given the rare RNLI Bravery Medal. Looking back on it now, I really can't believe that they hung on for so long. There's so many waves hitting them. It's amazing that they just didn't give up. I think it was really important that we had each other. It was kind of like we were getting strength from each other. You didn't give up because it was like, if. If I'd given up, I might have taken away a bit of Lisa's chance of surviving, and, and you, you just can't do that. If some people go through something very traumatic together, they become very close. All personal differences, all personality traits are put away, not there. It's all about basic human survival instinct. It was certainly the most frightening experience I've had so far in my life, yes although it happened very quickly. Um, yeah, without doubt, I was very, very frightened. They were extremely lucky. Uh, I think if we hadn't been called out for a false alarm, well, who knows, they may or may not have made it, but I don't think they would have done. We were all very, very lucky, actually. My mum always says, uh, your guardian angel looks after you, and I reckon it was on overtime that night. Every day, more than...